we saw before how to estimate the spatial lag model uh, with maximum likelihood. The main problem was the endogeneity of the spatially lag dependent variable. But we've already talked about how two stage least squares and instrumental variables address endogeneity. Now we're going to apply these very same principles to the endogeneity in the spatial lag model. And that gives us what I call a spatial two stage least squares estimator, which is in essence just the same two stage least squares estimator that we've had before, with the only difference that the spatial structure of the model gives us very specific instruments. The, if you recall, the challenge with two stage least squares was what are these instruments? What are instruments that are uncorrelated with the error terms and still correlated with the endogenous variables that they're supposed to replace? And that's not necessarily that easy to find. In the spatial case, it will be e easy to find because we have this thing called the reduced form. And because we have two stage least squares, we can have robust standard errors. If you recall, we can have heteroscedastic robust standard errors using the white approach, and we can have spatial autocorrelation robust standard errors with the hack approach. Of course, as I said before, the devil is in the details. You have to actually prove, if you're a theoretical econometrician, that this works okay in this particular case. And as we've seen when we talked about maximum likelihood, that's not that straightforward because the classic central limit theorems and laws of large numbers don't hold in space because of this weird weights matrix, which requires what is called triangular arrays, which is a, a very complex concept. But uh, at the end of the day, you get the same result. So the challenge for the theoretical econometrician is to come up with a proof that shows that at the end of the day, you have the same result. You have consistency and you know what the asymptotic variance matrix is. But for us, from a practical applied perspective, it's very easy to do because somebody else already did the hard work and said, okay, it's okay to do this. So now with this approach, we'll be able to estimate a spatial lag model and get robust standard errors. With maximum likelihood, we can't do that. Maximum likelihood, we're stuck with the, you know, second order partial derivatives and all that good stuff. Uh, so there's no room for robustness. We've assumed all the problems away, in a sense, with maximum likelihood. And then there's some debate in the literature. In practice, in my experience, and I have a lot of experience, it doesn't really matter that much, you know, but um, from a theoretical perspective, it's an interesting point. So spatial two-stage least squares, what is it? Basically, two-stage least squares apply to the spatial lag model, which has endogeneity in the spatially lag dependent variable, the WY, and possibly also additional endogeneity. With maximum likelihood, there was no way to handle that. With this framework, because we can handle as many endogenous variables as we want, as long as we have enough instruments, there's no constraint on in incorporating endogeneity in our specifications. We write the spatial lag model the usual way, but we organize parameters a little bit where now Z contains both the spatially lag dependent variable and X. And then theta is the parameter vector, which is rho, the spatial autoregressive coefficient, and beta. Right. So they're both in here. These transpose are just to make sure it's all lined up properly. But essentially, we're combining everything together. And now we're back in business because if you go back to our two stage least squares nodes, it's exactly the same expression. 
So what we need is a queue, a set of instruments, and then we have the whole same rigmarole as before. But the problem is, what are the instruments? And as I said, in the generic two-stage least squares case, it's sort of a guessing game, or as I put it, whoever screams the loudest, you know, what are the best instruments? Uh, in the spatial case, we actually have this reduced form. And the reduced form expresses Y as a function of all the Xs as this inverse transformation. We've seen this before. We've seen it when we looked at the impacts. This is the, uh, we call this the filtering matrix, I minus rho W, we take its inverse. Rho parameter is here, beta parameters are there. So they're all in here. Because this holds, we can also figure out, well, what is the conditional expectation of the spatial lag of the dependent variable? That's our culprit. That's the endogenous one. What is the conditional expectation of that given X? And we get that by just simply plopping a W in front of this. Right? That's all we have to do. Now we rely on the power expansion of this inverse matrix, which we saw before was I um, plus rho W uh, plus rho squared W squared and so on. And uh, this is the uh, power expansion of the series. And then the instruments have a W in front of this. So the instruments suggest themselves as spatially lagged explanatory variables. So here, there's no guessing game. The reduced form tells you what is correlated with the spatially lag dependent variable. It's this. This is exact, right? On average. Of course, there's an error term, but on average, we don't worry about the error. Term. So this tells us which variables are correlated with the endogenous variable, the spatially lag dependent variable. And because they're only Xs, by assumption, they're all uncorrelated with the error term. So in that respect, we're safe. There's others that are also uncorrelated with the error term, but they're not as good as this one in terms of precision, because this is exact the exact expression for the conditional expectation of the spatially lag dependent variable. So once we have that, everything else is easy. It's just looks complicated, but it's easy. So we have our instruments. This was a, a paper by Collegian and Pruka that showed if you use this expression for the conditional expectation of the spatially lag dependent variables, you have a natural set of instruments, namely all the spatial lags of the explanatory variables. The question then is, which ones do we use? Do we use the first one, first and second one, higher order? Um, in practice, you run into problems with multicollinearity, which I, if we get to it, I'll show you later today. Um, very often, the second and first order spatial lag, spatially lagged explanatory variables are, hard, are highly correlated. And the, the, therefore, it doesn't often doesn't make a lot of sense to add the second order weights. In fact, it creates problems because this multicollinearity makes the matrices near singular, and then you have all kinds of issues. So in practice, I would say at most second order, but definitely check for multicollinearity if that's the case. And it does matter, as we'll see in the notebooks. It does matter in terms of precision. It doesn't matter that much in terms of the actual estimate, but it does matter in terms of precision. So to get to this, and this is what I refer to as the hard work, it's been done 
you have regularity conditions, but as I mentioned before already, you have that triangular array central limit theorem. And um, that's very complicated, but basically everything else is the same as before. These regularity conditions do have some implications for the kinds of spatially lagged variables you can use. Uh, they cannot be exactly linear dependent. In other words, you can't have a case where the spatial lag is identical to the original variable. And we've already seen a case where that happens, namely in the SLX model, we did not include a spatial lag of the constant term. Because the spatial lag of the constant term is the constant term. So we cannot um, include that. There's some more um, requirements. And uh, one is that we cannot use spatial two-stage least squares for what is called the pure spatial autoregressive model, but nobody uses that. It's not really a practical model. That, that's simply y equals rho wy plus error term, no x's. If you have no x's, you cannot make spatial lags of the x's. So it doesn't work, right? The estimation is standard, as I said, you just have the instruments and then we have our same monsters back as before. Um, these are consistent. They're efficient, but not the most efficient. To get the most efficient, you need these optimal instruments. As I mentioned in practice, uh, it doesn't matter that much, especially not for larger data sets. And remember, these are all large data set methods. Everything is based on asymptotics. So if you don't have asymptotics, you may be in trouble. So that's all pretty straightforward. In contrast to the maximum likelihood setup, we can include additional endogenous variables, which is actually for applied work, much more realistic. Assuming pure exogeneity, in most cases in the social sciences is not really that good an assumption. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on at the same time. You know, crime influences economic conditions, economic conditions influence fry, you know, crime influences health, health influences economic conditions. So all these things are kind of interrelated. So assuming, assuming them to be exogenous can be a bit of a stretch. Now, how serious a problem that is that? That depends on each specific situation. There's no general answer to that. But we're in business. We just get some more instruments. Then the question is, do we use spatial lags of those instruments as well? As we'll see in a notebook, that is an option. Uh, there's not really a good argument not to, but there's also not a good, good, good argument to do it because they're not part of the reduced form. The instruments are not in the reduced form. Robust standard errors, I can do this fairly quickly because it's the same as what we've seen before. So we can do the spatial lag model with heteroscedasticity of unknown form. It's exactly the same approach as we did for two stage least squares, or for that matter, for OLS, the robust standard errors. So as before, it looks formidable. It's actually not that difficult to set up. And then we can also do the hack Estimators, same way, kernel function, uh, get the covariance matrix, plug that in, and we get this very complicated expression. But at the end of the day, they're just additional standard errors. As I mentioned, just, just using the spatially lagged Xs is good, but you can do better. And for a while in the literature, there was a big discussion. This is about 20 years ago about what is the best way to do this? What are the optimal instruments? In practice, it doesn't matter that much um, because there's an additional step involved. The optimal instruments, as has been shown formally in this article by Lee, consist of, just as we know, the reduced form, the whole thing. 
So what we did, or what Collegian and Prucha did, is they start with the reduced form. They use the power expansion to say, okay, let's just take the spatially lagged X's and we're in business, right? Now, if you want the whole thing, then this expression is the proper instrument. The problem with that is rho and beta are part of it. So we do the usual thing, which we already saw in the discussion of GMM. We get an okay estimate first, in a sense it's consistent, not very efficient. We plug it into here, and then we have the best estimate. What is X column? X what? X column. Oh, uh, this is Q all the instruments. The exogenous variables are their own instruments. So it's the exogenous variables. It doesn't need a comma. If there's enough space so that you see that it's two different things, um, correct. The problem with this is anytime, as I mentioned before, you see this inverse matrix, you have to remember this is of the size of the, the dimension of the size of the data set. So if you have 10,000 observation, this is a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. And it's not that straightforward to numerically compute an inverse of a matrix of that size. Luckily, they're sparse. So there are methods to do sparse numerical inversion, but they all have rounding errors. And once you get beyond a certain limit and that limit changes all the time, it used to be a thousand, now it's much more, but still there is a limit. So I would say for 10,000, it's starting to be really iffy. So then you have to do tricks like LU decomposition and things like that which can push it a little further, but still there is a limit. Very nice theoretical result. Practice, not so much because you have to compute this inverse. This was a back and forth between Lee and Collegian and Prucha and others. To avoid the inverse matrix, of course, we do the power approximation, but instead of doing it and saying we only take the lags, now we do the whole thing. And again, two steps. First, a row and a beta. Then we can compute this. No inverse is needed. We just use the power expansion, and then we're good to go. Okay. So that's the best two-stage least squares. So we have regular spatial two-stage least squares. Good enough, right? Then we have optimal two-stage least squares, optimal, you can't do any better, but you need to make an inverse, which is not that easy. And then you have best two-stage least squares, which is close to optimal, but it's not optimal because you use the power approximation. 